Здравствуйте, welcome to Russian Through Propaganda. Uh, today is day eight, and uh, today we're talking a bit about adverbs and conjunctions, but the most important thing we have to do is talk about verb tense in Russian. And uh, we have very good news today. There are only three tenses in, in Russian. Uh, and if we compare that to English for a moment, uh, you may have never given thought really to how many tenses English actually has. It's almost hard to keep track of all of them. First, you have the simple tenses, of course, like I work, right, present, simple present, I worked, I will work, right, just the simple tenses. And English also has progressive or continuous tenses, I am working, I was working, I will be working. Then we have uh, perfect tenses, right, like I have worked, I will have worked, right, future perfect. Uh, even a perfect progressive, I had been working, I have been working, I will have been working. So the list goes on and on, although I think I covered most of them. Oh, actually, one more, in these so-called emphatic forms, like I do work or I did work, right? So uh, we don't have to talk too much about that, luckily, because the point to be made is that in Russian has only three tenses. So the, the tense system is much, much simpler than English or maybe in other languages you may have studied. We're going to see later that um, Russian compensates for this largely through the use of verbal aspect, which is something that English doesn't really have, at least not in the systematic way that uh, Russian and other Slavic languages have, have it. And so that'll be something that's really unfamiliar and uh, will take a lot of work to, uh, to master. That's uh, one really difficult part of Russian grammar. But today, again, the news is good. We only have three tenses to worry about. And uh, I think because this is, this is so easy, uh, students often don't pay enough attention to it, right? So it's one of those things, uh, aspect will be really difficult and we'll have to think a lot about it, but tense really should not be a major issue. Everyone knows the difference between the, the past, the present, and the future, right? And that's all we're dealing with when in terms of choosing tense in Russian. Um, so let's start by talking... Uh, about infinitives. So an infinitive is, um, in English, that would be to work, right? Uh, to work. And then we take that infinitive form and uh, conjugate it based on the subject of the sentence. I work, she works, they work, and so forth. So we're going to talk more about Russian verbs and how they conjugate in the next chapter, right? Today, we're just focused on, uh, first of all, what is an infinitive? Uh, an infinitive in Russian looks like uh, this, bleach, bleach, or to stick with our example, rabotich, rabotich, right? Most infinitives in Russian end in a soft T, yeah. So we'll, we'll call that our basic infinitive ending. There are a couple of other ones, but they're relatively unusual. So the vast majority of infinitives will end in a soft T. So that's the first thing we're looking at today. And then the second is just uh, uh, the tenses of the verb to be, right? So if bleach, means to be, uh, then how do we say that something was or will be? Um, remember what Gomlet, uh, right? Gomlet's favorite question, uh, famous question, right? to be or not to be. Okay, so if we take the verb uh, how does it work in the present? Well, we've already been over that, right? We know that uh, Russian nowadays doesn't have fully conjugated forms for bleats to be in the present, right? It used to have that, by the way, um, forms like aziesim to yisi, and in the third plural, anisuit, but uh, those are obviously never heard today, really, unless someone is speaking a very archaic kind of uh, kind of Russian. The, the third plural form, suit, is seen every once in a while in formal writing uh, when it needs to be made perfectly clear that you have a third plural linking verb. But again, it's very unusual, especially for beginners. Right, so that basically leaves us with yest, right? Um, which originally was the third, the third singular form, meaning is, right? He, she, or it is yest. That form now works for any subject in the present tense. But as we learned also, um, that even that form is typically dropped unless it's being emphasized, right? So. Uh, we say things in Russian like on student, right? Uh, he is a student uh, where the linking verb yest is dropped and just simply understood. Right now, um, we saw, I think yesterday or recently, uh, if you're asking a question about does something exist, right? Do you have something? Uh, 
then the point of the question is the is, right? Is this thing in existence or not, right? For example, Utibia yest machina, Utibia yest machina. Now you can hear in the intonation, we'll talk more about that later, the rise and fall on the word in a question that's most important. Utibia yest machina, right? The, so the, the whole point of that question is yest. And so in that case, right, if the yest is being emphasized in that way, then we do include it in the Russian sentence instead of just leaving it understood. Okay, so that does it for present tense, the present tense of bleats in Russian, right? The only form we, we will ever see is yest, and even that will usually be dropped. Okay, let's move on to past tense of bleats. Now, the good news in Russian, we have lots of good news today, actually. The, the good news about the past tense is that it's almost always in Russian extremely easy to form. Uh, there are very few exceptions to this, although there are a few. Uh, we'll talk more about them, them later. Um, essentially, you take the infinitive, like bleats, right? Now, we already said that the soft T, the tia, that's your infinitive ending, so you're going to drop that, and you're going to add in its place an L, right? Uh, just the letter L, which in essence is the past tense marker. That L is going to mark the past tense. Um, that's a fairly old form. I could talk a bit about how this, how these forms came into existence. They were originally, well, th these these verb forms with L was were originally something called an L participle, um, that later was used to form a perfect uh, tense in Old Slavic, uh, which then uh, took the place of older past tense forms like the aorist and the imperfect. So it's kind of a, a messy picture historically. But in essence, in modern Russian, we're left with just the single past tense, right? There aren't any, there's no past perfect, there's not, no past continuous, nothing like that, right? So past tense, we again take the infinitive bleats, or whatever the infinitive is, get rid of the soft T, add L, and uh, that form all by itself is our masculine past tense form, like on will, on will. Uh, now, how can we make sense of that? Well, it's got basically no ending, or as we sometimes say, a zero ending. Just like on has no ending, or student has zero ending, right? That's what marks it as masculine. So this past tense verb form as well, will, will, has no ending. Just that L, which is, again, marking the past tense. It's not really an ending. Okay, so as we move on to the feminine, as you might guess, right, uh, think about feminine nouns like ana, uh, kniga, right? The a ah is marking the um, uh, grammatical feminine gender in Russian. So the past tense form of the verb bleach for a feminine subject will be bula. For example, ana bula, ana bula. And finally, for neuter, uh, we have o, right? Think about it. Ano, akno, right? That o is marking. Uh, at least hard, hard uh, neuter nouns and pronouns and whatnot. So the past tense form is going to be builla, 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 right? But we pronounce it builla. And by the way, what about the plural? Where, well, here, again, more good news. In the plural in Russian, we have only one form that works for all plurals. It doesn't matter if it's a we, if it's a you plural, if it's a they, and uh, it doesn't matter whether or not the we, you, or they are male or female or any of that stuff. There's only one past uh, plural form in the past tense, uh, and really in the plural generally for Russian. And that's really good news because if you were studying Czech or Polish or certain other Slavic languages, this would be a much bigger mess, right? So again, we're it, today at least we can count ourselves lucky. Okay, so uh, we know that. Uh, well, actually, we don't know yet. Sorry. We haven't talked about plural nouns. Remember, we're saving plural nouns for book two. That's one way we're sort of cheating in order not to be completely overwhelmed by, by grammar. Right. But we have seen the plural, uh, the third plural pronoun, ani, ani. Right. And I'll look at the e on that. And we're going to learn in book two that um, the, the most plurals are um, the basic ending is u or e. Right. Okay, so I ni buili, buili. Okay, so again, the plural, we're seeing that e marking these plural forms. I ni buili. So to review quickly, um, look at this table. 
uh, on был, она была, and note the stress on that. Uh, the ah uh, um, ending is sometimes stressed in the plural. We'll talk more about that pattern later. It's not extremely common, uh, but more, more on that later. Оно было, они были. Okay, there, those are all of the past tense forms of быть. So let's look at some uh, short sentences. Uh, and again, depending on the subject, we've got to have the verb form agreeing with the subject here in the past tense. So uh, let's just read a few here. Computer был новый. Right, computer is masculine. Computer был новый. Or if we substituted a pronoun, it would be on был новый. It was new. Machine была новая. The car was new, feminine. Or substitute a pronoun, она была новая. It was new. Let's take a neuter like uh, кресло. The armchair was new. Кресло было новое. Uh, look again how the verb and the uh, adjective are agreeing with the subject. Substitute a pronoun that would be оно было новое. Finally, plural, они были новые. They were new. Now remember again that in, in, for these plural forms, the only subjects we're going to have pretty much for all of book one uh, are они, which means they, of course, мы and вы, which mean uh, right, we and you, plural. And then uh, sometime fairly soon, we'll add the form все, which means everyone. Okay, so again, since we're ignoring plural nouns for now, those will be the only uh, subjects, unless I'm forgetting something, but those are definitely the major ones, the major plural subjects for which we would use a plural verb here in book one. Now, by the way, um, let's think about that. So uh, in what, what if you have a pronoun other than on, ana, ano, ani, right, the third person pronouns? Well, uh, your past tense verb would still reflect the gender of the speaker, right? So let's, what if we have an example with ya? Well, the ya, the speaker, could be male or female, right? So they'd make that choice accordingly, right? And say, ya will or ya willa. Ya will, ya willa. Same thing with tu, right? Tu is the you singular. So depending on what you we're addressing, we'd say tu will or tu willa. But remember, once we get into the plural, it doesn't matter what the subject is. As long as it's plural, there's only one option for the verb, in, in the past tense at least. Bwili, right? So, muy bwili, vui bwili. By the way, so uh, a quick question, vui, right? We know that that can mean you plural, or it can be the polite form of address, vui, uh, right, you in a polite sense, uh, that that pronoun vui will always be used with a plural verb, even if you're addressing a single person using the polite vui, right? So basically, you would never say something like vui will or vui willa, right? Uh, it would always be vui willi, regardless of whether you have a truly plural you or, again, if you're using this vui politely to address a single person. Okay, so that, that sums up the past tense. And uh, again, apart from a couple of little stress pattern irregularities uh, that are quite rare, and then again, certain verb types that will form the past tense in a somewhat tricky way, the vast majority of Russian verbs are going to form the past tense exactly as we just described it. So that's really, really good news. So now you've learned the past tense. Okay, let's practice a bit and uh, just, again, watching the subject and, and supplying the proper form of the past tense verb. In exercise 8a, uh, for example, машина была новая. The car was new. There's the feminine form. Uh, телефон, masculine, был новый. Телефон был новый. Окно, there's a neuter. Окно было большое. Окно было большое. Number three, the dictionary, словар. Okay, that's masculine, soft masculine. Slavar был хороший. Uh, неделя, that's uh, weak, soft feminine. The week was difficult. Неделя была трудная. Неделя была трудная. Uh, next comes задача, feminine. These are getting pretty easy, I hope. Задача была легкая. The assignment or the, the 
problem, really, I should say, Zadacha. The problem was uh, easy. Zadacha bula liochkeya. Number six, a neuter, a soft neuter. Zadanya bula trudnaya. The assignment was difficult. Zadanya bula trudnaya. Number seven, Muzie. Remember, that's a soft masculine. Muzie bul agromni. Muzie bul agromni. The museum was gigantic, huge. Number eight, Statia bula skuchnaya. The article was boring. Number nine, another feminine, Kniga. Kniga bula ruskaya. The book was Russian. Uh, number 10, film, film, bill, right, masculine, bill, ujasny, the movie was terrible. Number 11, bilio, bilio, what's that? That's a soft neuter, right? Remember, hard neuters end in o, soft neuters can end in ye, yeah, and sometimes in yo. Bilio, bila chistaya, bilio, bila chistaya. 12, uh, rabota. Work, the work was difficult. Rabota bula trudnaya, feminine. 13, mila, soap. The soap was expensive. Mila bula daragoya. Mila bula, nice rhyme there, daragoya, expensive. The pen was old. Ruchka bula stare, feminine. Okay, next we have a um, just conversational exercise, right? So we won't go through this since there aren't any correct answers, but you could practice talking about what kind of things you had last year, right? Think back to the past or to a few years back or whatever and say what kind of things um, you had, right? Uh, look at the examples here. Какая у тебя была одежда, right? So uh, think about yesterday, I think we were asking questions like какая у тебя одежда, right? In the present tense, what kind of clothing do you have? Какая у тебя Adyajda. Now, if you want to ask about the past tense, all we have to do is add in the, the past tense form of bleach, right? Какая у тебя была одежда? Дорогая или дешевая? Expensive or cheap? We're talking about одежда, a feminine noun. So, моя была дешевая. Everything talking about that, uh, that word is uh, feminine. Um, I'm not sure we've covered the moi, maya words yet. I don't believe we have, but anyway, they're here in the exercise for you. We'll, uh, if we haven't seen them yet, we'll see them soon. Okay, uh, so let's talk about future tense. Uh, future tense in Russian is also actually quite easy. Uh, and in fact, there's only one verb that has its own specific set of future tense forms. And if you take a wild guess, it's buit, right? The verb we're looking at today. It's the only verb in Russian that has a, a truly distinct set of future tense forms. Uh, now, how can that be the case? Well, for other uh, future tense uh, forms, we're going to use these forms today, the forms of buit as a helping verb. Right, so depending on the aspect of a given verb, and we're going to talk more about that in chapter two, but uh, uh, verbs that are uh, imperfective in aspect are going to form their future tense using this helping verb that we're about to learn. And then verbs that are perfective in aspect are simply going to be conjugated, right, as we'll learn in chapter two. And those conjugated forms will automatically be future tense in meaning. Right, so that's just a quick preview. Uh, we'll talk about that in great detail later, but that's just kind of telling us why, uh, how it can be possible that we only have really one verb in Russian that has this distinct set of future tense forms. Um, yeah, let's uh, look them over here. And so let's just memorize these. And uh, again, that will pretty much exhaust all of the, um, the specifically future tense forms of, of Russian verbs, right? Ya budu. Ты будешь, он, она, оно будет. Мы будем, вы будете, они будут. So let's let's run through it without the uh, pronouns. Буду, будешь, будет, будем, будете, будут. By the way, as we learn verb conjugations. Uh, as would be the case with pretty much any language, you're going to have to just kind of drill these forms until you 
internalize them, right? There's no real magic, uh, you know, silver bullet for memorizing these. Um, students ask me sometimes, you know, how can I how can I learn vocabulary? Well, I I don't really know any other way than sitting down and just drilling it over and over again, and then using it. Uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing, right? You have to know the words in order to use them, and you have to use them in order to learn them. You know, it's just a matter of practice and repetition, and there's really no trick to it. Um, you know, that's one difficult thing about learning Russian generally is that it takes time to learn vocab. It's not like uh, you're learning German and you're getting words like house, mouse, and German, right, and things like this, right, that are cognate with English, right? A lot of the words are completely bizarre. And that especially is true of verbs, right? The verbs are going to be maybe the hardest words to learn uh, because we're going to have to learn the, uh, the the conjugation patterns, right? So there really is little advice to give except just repeat it over and over again, practice it in context and, you know, in meaningful contexts. And uh, the more you do that, the, the more effortlessly it will, uh, it will come to you. Uh, so I'd maybe take some time after this lesson to just drill yourself. Budu, budish, budjet, budim, buditje, budut. Just say it over and over again, practice it in the drills, and in time you'll, uh, you'll be able to just produce these forms uh, without thinking about it. Let's look at a couple of um, examples. Vi budish doma, will you be at home? Okay, uh, this brings us to another point that I think is often a bit of bad advice given to students. Uh, I see this quite a lot. Um, they're told that Russian can drop pronouns, right? The way a lot of languages can, uh, especially inflected languages where the pronoun is in, uh, is in a sense conveyed by the verb ending, right? So think about this form budish, that ending, the sh sob sign, that's your t ending on the verb. And so that's really telling you that the subject of the verb is t. Right, and so for that reason, you can imagine how, why it's so easy, and in some ways efficient to drop the t, and say something like "budish doma, budish doma," right? Again, the full form would be "ty budish doma." Okay, is there anything wrong with saying "budish doma"? No, of course not. Russians do that all the time, uh, but depending on the context, it can sound just a little bit blunt or brusque, and um, for that reason. Um, I think it's really best for students to err on the side of including the pronoun uh, until you get a better sense of when it sounds um, appropriate to drop it. And again, usually that would be most common in, in just kind of rapid fire conversation, everyday colloquial, you know, spoken Russian. But again, I don't want to overdo this, right? There's nothing, it's, there's nothing offensive about dropping the pronoun. There's nothing wrong about it grammatically. It's just uh, sometimes students, they, they like this idea that you can drop the pronouns in Russian and they do it constantly and it, it starts to get a little bit, uh, too, just a little bit excessive. Okay, but again, in spoken Russian, listen for the pronoun drop. Budish doma, right? Will you be home? And then the response could be budu, budu, right? Where you've dropped the ya, right? The budish doma, ya budu doma, right? That would be the full form of that sentence. Uh, by the way, we could look at a couple of propaganda posters, right? Now that we've gotten the uh, future tense, uh, our first poster today says, That's exactly how it'll be. And by the way, later today, we're going to talk about conjunctions. E, which we've seen already, I believe, means and. Uh, but it doesn't always mean and. It can sometimes give a bit of emphasis. It can mean things like even or exactly. And that's kind of what it means here. Tak ano budjet would mean it will be thus, right? It will be this way, tak. And the e is just filling in something like uh, a sense that this is exactly how it'll be, right? Tak ano i budjet. And you see there the ruins of Gitlerskaya Girmanie, right? Gitlerskaya uh, is an adjective form from, formed from Gitler. Right, Hitler, of course, there's no H sound in uh, Russian, so they have to turn that into a, usually a G, sometimes a uh, Ha. Okay, uh, the next poster, uh, speaking of Hitler, uh, another poster from World War II, Tak Buila, Tak Budjet. 
so it was, so it will be, right? We ran Napoleon out uh, with the pitchfork there or whatever, and uh, there you see Gitler um, speared by a bayonet. Uh, so two invasions of Russia that didn't end very well, uh, to put it mildly. Okay, uh, let's do an exercise here, just filling in um, future tense forms of, actually uh, past and future tense forms of the verb. Right, so watch here for uh, little adverbs that are giving us clues as to which tense we need. Right, Sivoynya, that would of course be present tense. Uh, Vchira means yesterday, that would call for past tense, of course. And Zafra, tomorrow, that would call for future tense. Okay, so let's just say the same thing. Let's say these people are, were, and will be at home in these different times. Okay, first, number one, we have ya. Okay, so it's a speaker, and we're being told that the, the speaker is Baris, right? That he's a guy, right? So we're going to need masculine forms. Ya doma sivoynya. I'm at home today. Uh, now, what about vchira? Vchira, yesterday, ya buil doma, right? Ya, meaning I, Baris, ya buil doma vchira. Uh, future tense, ya budu doma uh, zavtra, zavtra, right? Tomorrow. Ya budu doma zavtra. Now, of course, in the future tense, as you may have noticed, we don't have to worry about gender. We're only worried about the person of the speaker, right? Ya ti, uh, right? First singular, first, second singular, third singular, and so forth. Okay, let's have a, femi a female speaker. Yulia, Yulia says, Ya doma sivodnya. I'm home today. I'm at home today. Okay, what about yesterday? Ya Bula, ya bula doma včera. I was at home yesterday. Ya budu doma zavtra. Zavtra, ya budu doma. Okay, number three, we have a ty. We're talking to someone. You are at home uh, today, and this someone is Mikhail. Mikhail. Okay, so again, a male uh, person we're addressing. Ty doma sivodnya. Okay, what about včera, včera? Ty byl doma včera. Ty byl doma včera. Masculine uh, subject, of course. You will be home tomorrow. Ty budiš. Ty budiš doma zavtra. Number four, ty, and we're talking to mama. Okay, so we, we're going to need feminine forms again. Ty doma sivodnya. You're at home today. Ty byla doma včera. Right, feminine, feminine bula. Ti budish doma zavtra. You will be at home tomorrow. Number five, Irina. Okay, so now we're talking about a, a she. We're talking about Irina. Irina doma sivonya. She's at home today. What about včera? Ana bula doma včera. And zavtra, tomorrow. Ana budit doma zavtra. What about Pavel? Okay, another masculine, another male name. Pavel doma sivodnya. He's at home today. On byl doma včera. On budit doma zavtra. Okay, now uh, seven, eight, and nine, we have uh, plural forms. Um, so past tense is going to be really easy. Muy doma sivodnya. We're at home today. Včera muy byli doma. Muy byli doma včera. Muy budim, muy budim, zavtra, uh, sorry, muy budim doma, zavtra. Zavtra muy budim doma. Okay, number eight, vy. Okay, so again, this could be vy, uh, a you plural, or the polite form of address to a single person, vy. Vy doma sivodnya. Vy byli doma včera. Vy budite. Doma zavtra. Vy budite doma zavtra. Number nine. Okay, now again, um, we mentioned that we uh, will only be using plural verbs with certain forms right now, like aini and sie and vui and mui, but remember we could also have a compound subject like we do here. That, of course, would also call for a plural verb form in Russian, uh, just like in English, right? Uh, he and I are friends, right? That plural compound subject. So let's take number nine. Pavel i Irina doma sivodnya. They are at home today. Again, in the present tense, we're always we're 
we're, we're usually dropping the yest. Uh, okay, so we go, but we go to the past tense. Včera ani byli, ani byli doma včera, and future tense. Ani budu doma zavtra, ani budut doma zavtra. Uh, next item is easy. We're going to throw in some adverbs, right? Some adverbs of degree, like uh, very or not very, completely, not completely, that we can add to adjectives to just uh, be a bit more specific and, you know, tell the degree by which some, or the degree to which something is interesting or boring. Okay, more good news today. I'm just a, a fountain of good, of happy tidings today. Adverbs in Russian never change their ending. Uh, so that's good news, right? Everything we've seen so far, now including verbs, we see how Russian is changing endings constantly. Uh, but adverbs don't do that. Now, why is that? Well, because adverbs, what do they do? They modify usually a verb. Uh, and sometimes, by the way, as we'll see today, adjectives or even other adverbs, right? Let's think about that. Um, um, he runs quickly, right? Well, there quickly is an adverb modifying a verb. Uh, but what about an adverb like very, right? Um, that's very interesting, right? There the adverb is modifying interesting, right? Modifi modifying an adjective. Or we could say in English something like uh, she runs very quickly, right? Quickly is an adverb modifying runs, and very is an adverb modifying the adver adverb quickly to tell us the degree, right? Very quickly. Okay, so if we think again about Russian, right, um, a word would only change its endings based on the gender and the number of the, the subject, right? Uh, so since the, uh, and that would be a noun or a pronoun, uh, usually. Okay, so since uh, an adverb isn't modifying a noun, it's not going to show gender. So it's kind of clear if you think about it why its endings are never going to change. Um, okay, so let's look at a few just basic adverbs of degree. Now, by the way, we just learned сегодня, вчера, завтра. Those are also adverbs of time, right? Telling when an action will take place. Now, adverbs of degree, очень, очень, meaning very or really. Okay, we can negate that uh, and say не очень, не очень, right? Not really, not very. Совсем, совсем, completely. Or не совсем. Not completely, not entirely. Davolna, davolna, meaning quite or rather, as in quite interesting, rather interesting. Ujasna, horribly, terribly. Ujasna. Sravnitilna, sravnitilna, meaning relatively. And uh, two with two O's, slishkam, slishkam. Okay, so we can just throw these in uh, to modify the adjectives we learned yesterday and say some more complicated things like, at the Davol Interestly film, right? This is a rather interesting film. Okay, what's the Davolna doing? Well, just like the rather in the uh, English sentence, right? It's modifying an adjective, Interestly. Right? At the Interestly film. This is an interesting film. Well, how interesting is it? Double Interestly, right? Rather interesting, quite interesting. Комната у тебя совсем грязная. Your room is completely filthy. Right? Совсем грязная. Totally filthy. Как дела? How are matters, right? How are things? Очень хорошо. Очень хорошо. By the way, dila there, there is an isolated example of a plural noun, right, that we, we are using here occasionally. We can't avoid it because it's so common. Kagdila, how are your affairs? How are your matters? How are things? Okay, a quick uh, conversational exercise you can practice at home. Uh, let's ask yourself, uh, tu optimist ili pessimist? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Uh, well, answer these questions to find out, right? Uh, quiz yourself and find out about the uh, optimist uh, or the pessimist. Okay, so think 10 years into the future and um, imagine what your life may look like. Какая у тебя будет машина? 
дорогая или дешевая? Question number two. Какой, какой у тебя будет телевизор? Большой или маленький? And of course, a gigantic television is maybe the best indicator of a successful uh, and meaningful life. So that's a very important question. Um, let's see, number three. Какая у тебя будет работа? What kind of work will you have? What kind of a job will you have? Интересная или скучная? And finally, какое у тебя будет расписание? Какое у тебя будет расписание? What kind of schedule will you have? Трудное или легкое? Difficult or easy? Okay, the final topic today is um, conjunctions and um, talking a bit about comparisons. Um, okay, so in Russian... Uh, we have two basic uh, conjunctions that are really easy and one that's a bit trickier, right? So uh, let's look at these examples and start with E. Okay, E is an easy one. It means and, okay? Like we're just adding to a list. Like I have a pencil and a pen and a book and a computer, right? Just simply adding things together. Uh, we could also add adjectives, by the way, like моя uh, книга новая, интересная, right? New and interesting. Okay, let's look at a few other examples. У меня есть ручка и карандаш. I have a pen and a pencil. Uh, какая у тебя ручка? What kind of pen do you have? Новая и хорошая, right? So there we're connecting two adjectives. Okay, so that's that's easy. It makes perfect sense. It's like English and uh, e. Okay, let's skip to the end of the table. And get another one that's quite easy to understand. No. No. Okay, that uh, lines up pretty well with the English but, right? Ручка у меня старая, но хорошая. My pen is old, but good, right? And you see, we have a bit of contradiction, right? Uh, we're talking about one thing, and we're saying contrasting things about it. Ручка у меня старая, но хорошая. Let's take a slightly more complicated one. We're talking about one subject, я, right? So a single person we're talking about here. Сегодня я дома. Today I'm at home. Но завтра я буду, я буду на работе. But tomorrow I'll be at work. Okay, so again, we have kind of contrasting uh, statements made about a single thing, or in this case, a person. Uh, that's но. Сегодня я дома. Но завтра я буду на работе. Okay, that leaves us with the one in the middle, and this is what causes some a, a bit of confusion, although I think I can um, help you avoid a lot of that. Uh, let's read these examples. Это карандаш, это ручка. This is a pencil, and that is a pen. Okay, you see the problem, right? We've translated that using and, so already we're confused. When do we use a, and when do we use e? Let's get a second example. Карандаш новый и хороший. A ручка старая. The pencil is new and good, but the pen is old. Okay, now we're using but all of a sudden to translate ah. Okay, so what does ah mean? Is it and, or is it but, or is it both at once? Okay, so the, the way to um, eliminate the confusion is to translate, at least, you know, initially in your head, translate Russian ah using the English while or even whereas. And uh, those will usually line up perfectly with the Russian use of a. Ah. Right? Let's look at that first example again. Это карандаш, это ручка. This is a pencil, while that is a pen. Right? This is a pencil, whereas that is a pen. And you see that the basic use of a ah is to uh, compare two things sort of alongside each other. There's no contradiction. You're just simply saying this thing is this, that thing is that. And we have sort of these two uh, things, they're both kind of doing their own thing, right? There's no internal contradiction. If we look at the second example, we see we have essentially the same thing going on. Карандаш новый и хороший. The pencil is new and good. А ручка старая. While the pen is old, right? Whereas the pen is old. Again, no internal contradiction concerning one item, but rather we're simply saying the pen, the pencil is like this, and on the other hand, we have over here, we have the pen and it's 
doing its thing, right? There's no clash um, uh, here uh, that would cause us to use nor. Uh, now, there are a few other uses of um, these uh, conjunctions, right? The first one, ah, um, let's look at this example. Это не карандаш, а ручка. This isn't a pencil, but rather it's a pen. Okay, so that just you see that more specific use of ah in the sense of rather, right? But rather. It's not this, rather it is something else. Это не карандаш, а ручка. Okay, here's one that's really important, and you'll definitely hear this when you start speaking Russian. Um, Ah is often used to introduce a follow-up question, right? So let's say you start a conversation, someone asks you, you know, um, how things are going or whatever, and then they start asking additional questions. You'll notice that Russians very, very often will start up questions like that with ah, right? And in that case, it doesn't really mean much of anything. It's just kind of marking a follow-up question. It's just kind of like a, well, it's a conjunction, um, I guess, but uh, just kind of marking an additional question, right? Kind of like, um, you know, well, what about this? Well, what about that, right? You're going from one, one question to another, that, that type of uh, thing, right? So definitely listen for that. Here's an example. Do you have a pen? Okay, that's our first question, kind of out of the blue. Da jest. Okay, we've answered it, and now we get an, an additional question. A karandash jest. Right now, we can imagine this also as kind of meanwhile or, or whereas, right? Or, you know, well, what about a pencil, right? I know you have a pen. Well, now, uh, meanwhile, what about a pencil? Karandash, yeast. Now, what about E? We've already mentioned that it can be used in various ways. Uh, more on that in a moment. But for now, let's see what happens if when we repeat E, right? E, E. That's how we say in Russian both and, right? Simply by repeating the e. Okay, so that's pretty easy here. Here are some examples. У меня и ручка и карандаш. I have, let's, let's translate it kind of literally. I have and a pen and a pencil, right? Okay, but of course in English we'd say I have both a pen and a pencil. I have both. Ручка есть и у нее и у меня. Okay, here using it with these, these prepositional phrases expressing uh, possession. Uh, there is a pen, there is a pen both at me and both at her and at me. Ruchka jest i u i u And finally, now with a couple of uh, adverbs. Ja budu doma i sivonia i zavtra, both today and tomorrow. Okay, so that does it for simple conjunctions. Of course, we'll add some more later. I think the, the most important one we didn't cover today is ili, meaning or. I think we've probably seen that already. Ili simply means or in Russian, so that's an easy one as well. And it presents no problems, right? Ili just simply lines up with the English or. Uh, okay, so in the next exercise, you could practice describing a few of your things, uh, again, just using adjectives. To answer this question, kakoi, and then uh, maybe trying to throw in an e or a noa, right? So let's I'll may, maybe just give a couple of examples. Kakoi tibia computer. What kind of computer do you have? Well, let's use an e. Um, let's say uh, novi i haroshi, right? New and uh, good. Novi i haroshi. Um, Okay, kakoi u tibia rukzak. What kind of backpack do you have? And now let's try to use a no. Okay, so we need to say two contradictory things about the backpack. Let's say it's uh, the backpack is old but good. Kakoi u tibia rukzak. Stari no haroshi. Stari no haroshi. Okay, let's do one more. Kakoi u tibia shampoon. A kakoi u tibia mula. Okay, now we've been asked about two things, so let's just describe each of them. And again, there's going to be no contradiction. We're just kind of comparing them. Um, each is, so to speak, doing its own thing, right? There's no contradiction. Shampoon u minya novi, a mila starya. 
that doesn't make much sense. Maybe old soap. Uh, sounds like we don't bathe very often. By the way, we'll see uh, lots of um, propaganda posters later just um, promoting basic hygiene and cleanliness, right? Like go, ba you know, bathe once a week and that type of thing. Okay, so maybe that isn't such an irrelevant example. But let, let's say I have expensive shampoo, shampoo and cheap soap. Shampoo у меня дорогой, а мыло дешевое, дешевое. Our final propaganda poster today points out something we mentioned earlier in the other poster, right? Takano i budget, right? And we just simply mentioned that uh, just because you see an e on the page, do, page doesn't mean it will always translate as and. Um, and here's a good example. Iza sucho pobidin. Okay, if we ignore the e for a moment, that that slogan here means pobidim uh, zasuchu means we will defeat or we will overcome drought. Okay, so now the, the question is, what does the E mean? Okay, um, now let's just translate it kind of naively and say, and drought we will conquer. Okay, that doesn't sound quite right in English, but I think you can already see uh, what it really means, right? And drought we will conquer. Okay, so how could we translate that better into English? We could say maybe um, we'll conquer even drought, we'll overcome even drought, or we'll overcome drought as well, right? We've overcome all these other things, we're going to overcome drought as well. Okay, so again, you see there that if, if and doesn't work to translate an E, try uh, even or two, right, with two O's, uh, T-O-O, two. Before we leave today, I thought I'd mention that um, if you're following the website uh, with each daily video lesson, I'll also have a worksheet, of course, and uh, a link to a Russian rock song. And almost all of these songs will be taken either from the late Soviet period, mostly the 80s, or the you know the early post-Soviet period after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, this is a really interesting scene. A lot of the music is really great, and uh, so I think the music is interesting for historical reasons, uh, at the very least. And a lot of it, I think, is really great, too. I really uh, I really fell in love with it myself when I was studying Russian. And I think in a lot of ways, that was one of my secret weapons to learning the language. When I first learned moved to Russia, I was buying all these, of course, at the time it was CDs, uh, buying all these CDs and just listening constantly to, uh, to these kind of classic rock records. So nowadays you could think of this as sort of like we do maybe of, of the genre classic rock. It's sort of these these older songs that uh, you know pretty much everyone has heard. Uh, uh, they may not be the most cutting edge pieces of music, but they've got a kind of timeless quality. Uh, so uh, I really uh, hope that you'll listen to some of them. I'll give you uh, the Russian text and a facing English translation and a link to the music uh, or a music video or something, or sometimes a live performance of some of these uh, songs. And I'll talk more about this whole uh, rock scene later. It was initially kind of an underground scene that, that flourished, especially in St. Petersburg. Uh, and by underground, I mean sometimes quite literally. Uh, the musician we're going to mention today is Viktor Tsoi. He's maybe the most famous um, of these Soviet uh, rock stars. And um, in the early days of his career, he couldn't perform publicly and he couldn't um, record and sell records publicly because the state had a monopoly on all of that stuff, right? So you had to get official sanction um, to do any of those activities. So he worked in a boiler room and uh, basically wrote his songs in between shoveling uh, scoops of coal into, into the furnace. And uh, he even gave uh, informal concerts there in the boiler room, which was literally underground. And I'll talk more about that later, but today that boiler room where he used to work is now a small rock club dedicated to his memory in St. Petersburg. Uh, anyway, later they um, opened the so-called Leningradsky Rock Club uh, on, on Rubinsteina Street in um, Petersburg. That was the first official public venue where these rock musicians could perform. Uh, so anyway, there's a ton we can say about this, and I, I will later. I even, I even taught a course on this topic. It's a really interesting one. And um, I think another nice thing about it is uh, 
in the book, you know, we have all this Soviet propaganda, and of course we, we need to think about that very critically, even though a lot, a lot of times it may strike us as very humorous. Of course, there's a much darker uh, side to all of that, you know, needless to say, but the, the lyrics of the rock uh, songs, I think, give us a different take on uh, on Soviet life, and especially by this late period on disillusionment with uh, the whole utopian project. Uh, so we have someone like Victor Tsoi, who is kind of known as a kind of, um, well, kind of gloomy, somber, reflective, but also stoic and really kind of courageous, but kind of lonely um, individual, right? So he sort of uh, took this more romantic uh, um, direction in terms of talking about your sort of existential angst and loneliness and search for meaning and these kinds of things that really were not uh, part of the officially uh, sanctioned uh, Soviet um, uh, world. Uh, you know, you should be writing about, about things like labor and the collective and the march to communism and things like this, right? Not about your personal fears and feelings and uh, things, things of that nature. So today I thought I'd show you a... Um, a landmark in Petersburg that's dedicated to the memory of Victor Tsoi. This is the Stina Viktora Tsoya, uh, the wall of Viktor Tsoi. And we got that Russian construction by adding genitive endings to the name Viktor Tsoi, right? That gives us Viktora Tsoya. And that genitive, uh, those genitive endings express possession in Russian. So the wall of Viktor Tsoi. We'll learn the genitive case in the next chapter. Uh, so Victor Tsoi's uh, band was called Kino, which means the movies or cinema or something, Kino. Um, so you see this is right in the middle of Moscow uh, uh, on the um, Arbat Street. Arbat is one of the more famous streets in Russia. Today, the old Arbat in Moscow, I should say. Today, the what's called the Stary Arbat, the old Arbat Street, is a pedestrian zone, as you can see. And there are lots of musicians there performing and uh, things like that. And there you see right there the wall of Viktor Tsoi, which is covered with graffiti, and it's always changing. Um, so here's another view, right? Uh, now, supposedly this started uh, the night following the death of Victor Tsoi. Tsoi died tragically and, uh, you know, at a very young age uh, on August 15th, 1990. And note that this was just very shortly, just a couple of months before the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union, right? He, uh, well, a year or so. He, he, uh, um, he didn't live to see the collapse of the Soviet Union in December of 1991, right? So he missed it by about a year, I guess. Uh, so anyway, when his fans learned of his death, they were devastated. By that point, Kinoa had risen from the, the underground scene to be uh, wildly popular. And um, anyway, a, a fan, a grief-stricken fan, supposedly wrote on this wall simply, Sivonya Pagib Viktor Tsoi. Viktor Tsoi died today. And then someone else wrote uh, what has become a very famous uh, line, Tsoi Jiv. You can say that about anyone, by the way, including Lenin. Uh, we'll see that later in the textbook, right? Lenin lives, right? Lenin is still alive. Tsoi Jiv, Tsoi lives, right? He's still alive. You see that a lot on the on the uh, wall here. And again, so fans just come and write their own message. Usually it's some uh, snippet of lyrics from Victor Tsoi's songs uh, or some, you know, some little clever take on the, some clever variation of his words. Uh, we see here right in the middle, Pyrimien, which is a, a one-word quote from one of his more famous songs, which uh, has a line in it, which says, Pyrimien, we're waiting for change. And uh, even though Tsoi was largely kind of apolitical, um, you know, people at that point were kind of just sick of politics, especially young people. They were sick of all the communist ideology. Again, for the most part, I'm painting with a broad brush here. But of course, um, even being apolitical was itself unavoidably sort of a political act. And Soy was known in his songs, especially his earlier ones, for kind of uh, glamorizing, kind of being a slacker, not working, not caring about anything, just kind of wandering around and and uh, musing on the purpose of the meaning of life. Uh, 
Uh, here's the band name Kinoa. Uh, so one of their little symbols from some of the album art is an eclipsed sign, a uh, full eclipse there, Kinoa. Nivri Sibia, don't lie to yourself. Nivri Sibia. Um, so that's an example of Soy. Uh, you know, he was kind of known for being kind of brutally honest and authentic and, uh, um, you know, kind of cutting through the, the lies of official propaganda. Here's another line from one of his songs. Я не люблю, когда мне врут, но от правды я тоже устал. That's from the song, the, the song Muravienik, which means anthill. So this means I don't love when they lie to me, but I'm also tired of truth. Okay, so that seems to be a kind of a, a satirical jab at pravda, at the just the idea of political or communist truths uh, generally, and also more specifically, the famous communist newspaper Pravda. Um, yeah, here's a song from a, a line from a song that's already posted on the website. Uh, it's called Grupa Krovi, uh, which was released in 1988. It's also the name of an album. The English is the translation is Blood Type. So look for the song Blood Type on the site. Uh, this was a gigantic hit, and it set off a wave of so-called kinomania. Kinomania, right in the in the Soviet Union. There's a line there that says, "Yes, чем платить, но я не хочу победы любой ценой," which means I have something to pay with. Uh, it's a little hard to translate that. <clears throat> I have something with which I can pay, and I think he means there his life, right? He can pay with his life in this battle. But then he says, "No, я не хочу победы любой ценой." but I don't want victory at any cost. So you see again this kind of pacifist um, uh, reluctance to, to join in this battle and give up one's life for whatever cause it may be. Um, yeah, and here's one more line from the song. Um, Can you find that here in the graffiti? Is at the very bottom uh, in the blue, right? Ya ni astanus vati travia, and that's a little paraphrase of the lines from the song uh, "Grupa Krovi." Pajelaim ni udachi v bayu, pajelaim ni ni astatsa vati travia. Wish me luck in battle. Wish uh, for me not to remain lying in the grass, meaning not to die in battle, and remain lying in the grass. Okay, so that was just a, a very brief intro to Russian rock and uh, Victor Soy. I'll talk a lot more about him later. And uh, again, as you follow the course, uh, click on the, the link to the rock song, and I think you'll enjoy a lot of the lyrics. A lot of them are really thoughtful and sometimes really funny. And uh, I think a lot of the music is really great. And uh, I think uh, Victor Soy, I remember the first time I heard him, I hadn't heard of this group before I went to Russia. And uh, this was in 2000, so it's, you know, um, uh, I was in the uh, the dorm at Moscow State University with some Russian friends, and I heard uh, Victor Tsoi come on the radio, and I was just kind of uh, very struck by his voice and uh, the music, and I really kind of fell in love with it. And uh, I think a lot of students really enjoy Victor Tsoi. Uh, you know, one thing I could say about this music generally is, again, it's kind of like the classic rock genre. It's not like it's the hippest thing that, that young people are listening to these days, but it is nowadays sort of just part of the the cultural um, uh, background noise in, in Russia. And so, for example, you, you'll you hear especially the songs of Victor Tsoi just kind of everywhere, coming from cars in the street, uh, being played just kind of in random places. You'll see street artists covering Victor Tsoi all the time. Um, you know, just lately, the past few years, there's been a, there's been a really good cover band uh, uh, playing on Nevsky Prospekt. I've seen them several times, and they're always playing Victor Soy, and they sound really great. I think actually, uh, so just being familiar with these songs can be a great way to practice your Russian and also just kind of increase your cultural fluency uh, generally. Okay, that's enough for today. Uh, until next time, до свидания, товарищи.